Clay Stauffer graduated from Haverford College in 1976 after studying art and literature and majoring in religion. He spent 19 years in the, wait a minute, he spent 19 years in the daily newspaper industry in five states, including 11 years as publisher of the Holland Sentinel. After his newspaper career, he earned a BFA from Kendall College of Art and Design in 1999 and earned an MFA from the University of Chicago in 2001. He subsequently taught art studio art and senior thesis courses at Kendall and has maintained a studio art practice since then. Clay's paintings have been exhibited widely and are now in numerous private and public collections. Clay is married to the talented Barbara Griffin. This morning, Clay will present the first part of our course, Television Gets Weird, The Cold War, The Twilight Zone, and Censorship in the United States During the 1950s. Clay, take it away. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate your kind introduction. Um, as, uh, as I think you know, this, this course is in two parts. And uh, the first part, I'm going to kind of try to set the stage for a more in-depth in, uh, look at the Twilight Zone itself and uh, television in, in the 1950s. So uh, I hope that the first part, the first session is not too dry. I'm going to try to keep it interesting. Um, and I encourage you to use, uh, to ask questions. We'll stop from time to time and try to punctuate the program with uh, your comments, questions, and thoughts. So this becomes more of a conversation rather than uh, me just droning on and on. Um, having said that, I'm going to uh, share a screen, share the screen here so that you can see the slides. And that I'm assuming everybody can see that image of the Twilight Zone slide. Uh, okay, great. Um, well, here we go. And as I say, please uh, uh, interrupt at any time with a comment or a question. That way, it'll it'll be more interesting. Uh, and uh, anyway, let's get going. Um, well, the topic, uh, the title is Television Gets Weird, The Cold War, Twilight Zone, and Censorship in the United States During the 1950s. I have a little epigraph here. Uh, from the philosopher uh, Richard Rorty, which I thought was kind of pertinent and kind of the mission statement, uh, or at least a description of what we're trying to do here. The process of coming to see other human beings as one of us rather than as them is a matter of detailed description of what unfamiliar, unfamiliar people are like and redescriptions of what we ourselves are like. This is a task not for theory, but for genres such as ethnography, the journalist's report, the comic book, the docudrama, and especially the novel. The novel, the movie, and the TV program have gradually but steadily replaced the sermon and the treatise as the principal vehicles of moral change and progress. And that's uh, from a book of his, Contingency, Irony, and Solidarity. But uh, I guess that lends kind of a stamp of authority what we're trying to do here. Um, so this, es this essay began as somewhat of a lark for the Holland Professional Club during the fall of 2020 while the COVID pandemic and election were seemingly at their climax. Tom Arnshorst was in the Zoom audience and asked me whether I would consider doing an expanded version for HASP. My premise as the epigraph reinforces was that what was airing on television in its early days became tremendously influential in American culture of the 1960s. Even more to the point, my claim was that Rod Serling and the strange television show he created matters to us now. To support this claim, I first want to explore the cultural and social norms of the 1950s. The 1950s often get a bad rap, a misunderstanding of the decade that typecast it as stagnant, dull, and unexciting. Nothing could be further from the truth. Rock and roll was born in the 50s, arguably in Memphis, when Jackie Brenston and his Delta Cats recorded Rocket 88. 
Marlon Brando mastered the role of Stanley Kowalski in Tennessee Williams, A Streetcar Named Desire, and won an Oscar for his role in On the Waterfront. Allen Ginsberg wrote his epic Howl in the mid-50s. Jack Kerouac wrote On the Road in the mid-50s. The list of authors at the peak of their careers includes James Baldwin, Norman Mailer, Ralph Ellison, J.D. Salinger, and E.B. White. The visual arts were revolutionized by Jasper Johns, Robert Rauschenberg, Jackson Pollock, Helen Frankenthaler, Willem de Kooning, Mark Rothko, and many others. We can count this exercise as success if by the end we have a deeper understanding both of the decade of the 1950s and our own time. And I dare say most many of us in this Zoom call are, uh, 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 were born in the 50s. So anyway, this talk is divided, as I said, into two parts. To understand how revolutionary Serling's show was, we first need to gain an understanding of the 1950s, what life was like, what people were thinking and feeling. In the first part of this two session course, we'll explore the 1950s from cultural, societal, and economic perspectives. Next week, we'll focus on television, Rod Serling himself, and the Twilight Zone in detail as interpreters of this brave new world. The Golden Age of Television, Post-War America and the Rise of Consumerism. Friday, October 2, 1959 was not a particularly eventful day for most Americans. The most notable event might well have been the introduction by General Motors of a new model called the Corvair, which like the increasingly popular Volkswagen Beetle, featured both a rear mounted and an air cooled engine, the first in US automotive history. A total eclipse of the sun was visible from the Northeast United States to West Africa. And a new half hour television series called The Twilight Zone premiered on CBS television at 10 p.m. Eastern time. The new show appeared opposite the detectives on ABC and the Gillette cavalcade of sports on NBC. The Twilight Zone was the first speculative fiction television show. Speculative fiction is a broadly defined category that can incorporate elements of science fiction, fantasy, horror, drama, and related genres to tell a story. It's a venerable form some of our most loved writers, including Edgar Allan Poe, H.G. Wells, J.R.R. Tolkien, and Ursula K. Le Guin were practitioners. Many newer writers, including writers of color and women, find the genre, loosely defined as it is, a fruitful way to write. Octavia Butler, Margaret Atwood, Samuel R. Delaney, and Lois McMaster come to mind. In some ways, The Twilight Zone was a throwback to the anthology drama shows that had been staple TV fare in the early 1950s. That was no accident. The Twilight Zone's creator, Rod Serling, had by 1959 won three Emmys and had been nominated for three more for his work on successful drama anthology series such as Playhouse 90 and the Kraft Television Theater. The decade spent in the 1950s is often called television's golden age. It was in a sense TV's childhood. Low definition TV broadcasts began in New York City and Los Angeles in 1931. But it was not until July 1st, 1941 that the Federal Communications Commission granted the first high definition broadcasting licenses to NBC and CBS owned stations in New York City and a Philco owned station in Philadelphia. In 1942, there were an estimated 5,000 TV sets in operation and about 40 million radio sets nationwide. The US entry into World War II curtailed almost all broadcasting and TV set production during the war years. But by 1947, there were about 44,000 TV sets in the United States, most of them in the New York metropolitan area. The growth of the television industry was so rapid after the war that in 1948, the FCC faced with a shortage of available channels and related signal interference problems, placed a moratorium on applications. Though the moratorium was expected to last only six months, the freeze was in place until April 1952, when about 100 stations were broadcasting. The lifting of the moratorium brought a rapid expansion of television to areas that had few stations, including the Southern United States. By 1950, almost 4 million US households had at least one TV set. That represented about 9% of the country's total number of households. As of 
At that stage in TV's growth, most of those TV sets were in upscale households in urban and suburban markets. But the growth of television continued rapidly. By 1960, there were 45.75 million US households with at least one TV set, roughly 90% of American households. <clears throat> television helped to accelerate the changes occurring in American society. For consumer products companies, television advertising gave marketers an entirely new medium in which they could exploit sound and images in motion. A young chemist named Hazel Bishop in 1948 developed a lipstick that wouldn't smear during a kiss or leave a mark on a glass. She was selling about 50,000 tubes a year by 1950. Two years later, after a TV ad campaign, she was selling four and a half million tubes a year. Television's immense power stemmed partly from its claim to immediacy. It claimed to give Americans access to a new level of truth not only by seeing things, but seeing things immediately. As Dumont Network executive James M. Cadigan wrote in a 1947 edition of the fledgling, fledgling industry journal television, the public is being given the promise of seeing things as they happen. It is their enthusiastic expectation of immediacy of television that will present a challenge to every station to present the scoop news in a speedy, and complete a manner as possible. <clears throat> Advertisers were quick to leverage this authority and veracity that television had claimed. Early commercials present a distinctly didactic approach, telling viewers of special formulas that whiten teeth, filter cigarettes, or clean skin better than competitors' products. Here's a cigarette commercial from uh, that era. Discover the clean difference. The clean difference in today's smoking with new Dark Air cigarettes. Easy to smoke, <clears throat> clean with better air. Better fresh menthol blend. The clean difference in taste. Deep set, recessed filter. The clean difference in filter tips. The clean difference in. And this is an amazing use of radioactivity in a consumer product. So nowadays we speak of radioactivity as being uh, a repellent sort of force, but uh, in the 50s, it was a new, obviously a new thing. As TV set ownership increased in cities and small towns, people tended to stay home in the evenings to watch TV rather than going out to catch a movie or take a stroll downtown. Prominent critics of television, such as Gilbert Seldes wrote, the fact that television can transmit actuality is of prime psychological importance. It invites us to the conception of things as they are. It sets us on the way to maturity. 
Seldes warned that mass media had become as powerful in shaping our lives as our schools, our politics, our system of government. In a 1948 issue of The American Scholar, Joseph T. Clapper wrote that it was now commonly believed that never before in history has public opinion lain so completely at the mercy of whoever may be in control of the mass media. It's important to note that even television's critics were a diverse group with finely shaded opinions on the new medium. In the 1961 preface to The Lonely Crowd, David Reisman and his co-authors wrote, we refused in The Lonely Crowd and we still refuse to join the undifferentiated assault against the shoddy symbolic goods carried by the media. The vast amount of time most Americans spend with television is appalling, but the pre-TV alternatives such as driving aimlessly about, sitting vacantly, attending sports events, or playing canasta are hardly more real or less appalling. Americans wanted to do things after the war, and they could now, thanks to their increasing prosperity. According to the Pew Research Center, income growth in the 1950s and the 1960s was the most robust for American families since the end of World War II. The mean income for families overall increased at an average annual rate of 2.9% from 1950 to 1960. Income equality was reduced. The mean income of families in the lowest economic income quintile increased at an annual rate of 3.7%, while the mean income of families in the top 5% increased at a lower rate, an annual rate of 2.2%. This gave Americans the resources to buy homes and cars. The percentage of American families owning cars increased from 54% in 1948 to 74% in 1959. Motor fuel consumption rose from some 22 million gallons in 1945 to around 59 million gallons in 1958. It would be difficult to overstate the significance of the automobile in post-war American culture. The resumption of automobile production in 1945 signaled not just the beginning of a return to normalcy, but an entirely new era in American history. The styling of post-war cars commuted a spirit of modernism, change, and exuberance that fine art had traditionally communicated. The first Detroit auto with tail fins, a 1948 Cadillac, was inspired by the Lockheed P-38 Lightning fighter aircraft. As the 1950s unfolded and auto sales began to flatten, automakers featured more and more of what industry insiders called borax, the prominent and functionally redundant tail fins, chrome hood ornaments, and faux air vents that characterized 1950s auto styling. Americans clearly liked borax, despite or perhaps because it communicated a certain wastefulness, ostentation, braggadocio, and egocentrism. The Serviceman's Readjustment Act, commonly known as the GI Bill, provided returning veterans with money for college, business, and home mortgages. Residential construction jumped from 114,000 new homes in 1944 to 1.7 million in 1950. Real estate developers such as William Levitt in New Jersey platted neighborhoods such as Levittown, the archetype of the post-war American suburban development. Between 1940 and 50, suburban communities of greater than 10,000 people grew 22.1% and planned communities grew at an astonishing rate of 126%. Not all Americans could participate directly in this post-war expansion. Redlining prevented most black families from obtaining mortgages in areas deemed hazardous by mortgage lenders. Levittown was all white. In 1948, in Shelley versus Kramer, the US Supreme Court struck down the legality of racially restrictive home ownership covenants but it would not be until mid, the mid-1960s when federal fair housing regulations were enacted that opponents of such covenants had the legal resources to fight discriminatory practices effectively. I might pause at this point and just ask if there are any questions or comments, uh, um, any thoughts anybody wants to add to anything. Um, just real quick, Clay, a couple people have said they had a hard time hearing the sound in their commercials. Um, so I was able to turn it up a little bit on my own computer and then turn it back down when you're speaking because I hear you fine. So I don't know if there's something you can do about volume for the okay. commercials on your end, but 
Um, yeah. We can I increase think the I volume can, because um, that would help. I will think about that and see what I can do about that. Um, That's all I have. So anybody else that wants okay. to ask a question or make a comment right now, go ahead. All right, I will go ahead and uh, trying to think what I can do about the volume. Because um, I think it's kind of automatic. Let me just check something. I don't know. I'll I'll probably turning up the volume on the on the audio interface and see if that. I have a question. Okay. When uh, when did, I'm Suzanne Harrington, um, when did the shift of women working start to really go into effect? Because they had been the workforce during the war to a certain extent, and then they had to take their back seat and be women at home again. And I'm just the, wondering. No, that, that's a great point. And actually that is um, one of the things I'm gonna get to shortly. Um, the short answer is really that women lost ground after the war. Uh, as you, as I'm sure know from your question, uh, during the war, women stepped into the breach and uh, worked in factories and, and throughout the economy to replace, frankly, to replace men who were uh, at war. Well, men and women at war, but particularly men. And, uh, but after the war, there seemed to be a real recognition that uh, women should not, should not try to compete with men, should, uh, should back out of their positions. And uh, in fact, there are a number of, uh, all sorts of uh, citations that, that could be quoted. I, I didn't go into detail, but uh, president of Radcliffe College, you, you know, after the war, um, uh, Dr. Spock, Dr. Benjamin Spock, who was uh, a very significant influence, they really encouraged women to go back into the home and make the home their domain. And uh, that had a real effect on women, obviously. Um, Betty Friedan in 1955 was asked to uh, contact other Smith College alumna and do sort of a, a census, if you will. And uh, that was the being, beginning of her uh, very influential book, um, The Feminine Mystique. But um, that's a great comment and uh, it's uh, extremely important for the long haul. And it did affect a lot of the programming um, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz in, in their show, I Love Lucy, which started out as my favorite husband in the early 50s. Uh, that was an, a tremendously influential show, arguably, along with Perry Mason, maybe the most successful show to date. Uh, Lucy was tremendously subversive in a brilliant, just a really brilliant way. If you watch her, the things that she gets at, and she does it with humor, but the point nevertheless is there. So that's a great, great question and a great point. And, and when we get to the twilight zone, I, I don't know that Rod Serling dealt with that as pointedly as perhaps he could, but uh, it certainly is in the background of the tension that existed in the 50s in, in American society. I'll go on and, we'll, and we'll, we'll address that here shortly. Like its cousin radio and its distant relatives daily and weekly newspapers, American television was at its inception an advertiser supported, supported medium. Television was entirely dependent on ad revenue and its stock and trade airtime was naturally limited. As television matured, the relationship between its stakeholders, viewers, advertising, sponsors, and producers began to develop fault lines. These fissures grew from corresponding social problems within American society, which made the polarities all the more irrepressible. As monolithic as the big three networks seemed, they were partners with their local affiliates, local television stations, which in turn often tended to amplify real or potential issues over content 
that might offend their audiences. Conflicts about programming often reflected regional differences. Early on then, the stage was set for repeated clashes between advertisers and programmers, that is the networks. Advertising revenue was the keystone of this new edifice, commercial broadcasting. Advertising dollars paid for programming, broadcasting technology, the systems were being built out at that point, and salaries. I'll turn up the volume here. It was in Great Britain that advertising arguably well, it was in Great Britain that advertising arguably was seen most clearly by founders of the pop art movement. Allison and Peter Smithson, architects and members of the independent group, a loosely defined collection of London artists, bound together by our enthusiasm of the iconography of the new world, wrote Edward Palazzi, an early member of the IG. Of advertising, the Smithsons wrote in their 1950s. Can you hear me now? Okay. Ads are packed with information, data of a way of life and a standard of living, which they are simultaneously inventing and documenting. Mass production advertising is establishing our whole pattern of life, principles, morals, aims, aspirations, and standards of living. What we now call pop art had its beginning in the meetings of the independent group. 
British artist Richard Hamilton's famous collage, what is it that makes today's homes so different, so appealing, has become iconic in art history. Andy Warhol, Jasper Johns, and other American pop artists would continue this examination of consumer products and advertising during the ensuing decades. To gain some perspective, it might be helpful to contrast Great Britain with the United States. Until 1954, the British Broadcasting Corporation enjoyed a monopoly on TV broadcasting. License fees paid by TV set owners financed the BBC's operations. Commercial broadcasting as conducted in the United States was widely regarded as vulgar. In an address to a convention of television executives in 1954, Anurin Bevan, a Labour Party leader and former health minister asked, why should we always imitate the worst features of other countries? The Conservative Party, however, which had gained power in 1951, wanted to permit commercial broadcasting in the United Kingdom which the Television Act of 1954 accomplished. Many Brits, by the way, were offended that in the 1953 coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, the broadcast was interrupted in the United States by a commercial featuring a well-known chimpanzee, J. Fred Muggs. Advertising, mass communication devoted to the promotion of products and services and the creation of needs and desires for products and services first became politicized during the Great Depression. In post-war Britain, the legitimacy of television advertising had been hotly debated by social critics. Bevan had called advertising an evil machine which is doing great damage to modern society. In the United States, the Madison Avenue advertising executive became a stock figure of a soulless sellout willing to write anything to sell soap. Well before the popular series Mad Men, the advertising industry was seen by many as fueling a competitive, a competitive decadent consumerism. The growth of post-war consumerism in Britain and the United States was hotly debated. In the United States, Thorstein Veblen, the American economist and philosopher, had pioneered the examination of consumption in the theory of the leisure class in 19, 1899. Veblen focused on the social significance of consumption rather than the classical economic view of marginal utility that is the satisfaction given to the individual by the last unit acquired. In short, Veblen argued, consuming is a social act, a means of social communication. Veblen's analysis would be profoundly influential to thinkers as diverse as Jean Baudrillard, Pierre Bourdieu, Douglas Holt, Alex Kotlowitz, and Betty Friedan. One cannot defend production as satisfying wants if that production creates the wants. John Kenneth Galbraith wrote in his influential book, The Affluent Society in 1958. The historian David Potter wrote in People of Plenty published in 1954 that advertising was turning Americans into American consumers. Drawing on his reading of Marx, the Frankfurt School political, political theorist Herbert Marcuse in One Dimensional Man argued that the people recognize themselves in their commodities. They find their soul in their automobile, hi-fi set, split level home, kitchen equipment, Humans become extensions of commodities, nothing more. Any revolutionary consciousness that would bring about the end of such alienation is crushed by rampant commodification. Two other Frankfurt School figures, Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer, had argued similarly in their 1944 essay, The Culture Industry, Enlightenment as Mass Deception. Adorno and Horkheimer accurately predicted the dumbing down of art and culture. The concentration of cultural producers and the spread of an entertainment society. One has only to look at the global industry, entertainment industry of our time, by some valuations, an astonishing $2 trillion market to see the prescience evident in Adorno and Horkheimer's essay. Vance Packard, in his well known book, The Hidden Persuaders, published in 1957 outlined the use of psychological research to subliminally create needs and desires in viewers that advertised products would satisfy. Packard identified these motivating needs as emotional security, reassurance of worth, ego gratification, creative outlets, love objects, sense of power, roots, immortality. Not surprisingly, these needs, of course, resemble 
Abraham Maslow's well-known hierarchy of needs, first outlined in his 1943 paper, A Theory of Human Motivation. Leading advertising agencies applied these findings to their own work for consumer products companies. The post-war growth in the ubiquity of advertising and brand name consciousness in almost every sphere of life was evident and controversial for some Americans. Even before direct US involvement in the Second World War, influential business and political figures saw a threat to capitalism that had emerged in the 1930s. New, New Deal progressivism at home and socialism abroad. In 1941, 700 business and media executives gathered to discuss the danger posed by those who would do away with the American system of free enterprise. The deduction of advertising as a legitimate business expense was just one immediate threat. The attack on advertising, a CBS presentation warned, was part of a vast worldwide struggle between two philosophies, the totalitarian idea with people as the vassals of the state against the American philosophy of free enterprise and free competition and free opportunity for the individual to realize his own destiny through free institutions. The answer, said James Young of the J. Walter Thompson Agency, was to enlist the greatest aggregate means of mass education and persuasion the world has ever seen, namely the channels of advertising communication. The looming war overshadowed the implications of Young's proposal. As war approached, the War Advertising Council was created to contribute tax deductible advertising to assist the US war effort by promoting the sale of war bonds, victory gardens, and other wartime programs. The council's efforts had redeemed advertising. Even so, the council's 1945 report warned of the threat that communism and state socialism posed to the American way of life and business. The War Advertising Council thus became simply the Advertising Council. In the next 15 years, the council would become a key facilitator in a mass propaganda effort to reassure Americans that productivity gains were being shared equitably, that free enterprise would mean a better life for every American. The council was not the only source of pro-business propaganda. William White, the author of the influential 1956 book, The Organization Man, estimated that by 1952, American businesses were spending $100 million annually of their advertising, public relations, and employee relations budgets on economic education. Businesses, businesses would not spend resources on economic education were there not a corresponding perceived threat. The post-war years in the United States were plagued by fractious labor relations. The Republicans gained control of Congress in the 1946 midterm elections, the first time they had done so since 1930. President Truman's 1948 re-election platform, the Fair Deal, was a progressive extension of FDR's New Deal. One of Truman's priorities was a national health insurance plan. Another was an ambitious civil rights initiative for which he felt he had a compelling moral mandate to pursue. Neither of these measures achieved success in Congress. Communism was a major issue. As Truman approached the 1948 elections, he sought to forestall the issue and blunt Republican exploitation of the fear of communism. In March 1947, Truman signed an executive order, the loyalty program, that authorized screening 5 million federal employees for communist leanings. Nearly 2,700 federal employees were fired between 1947 and 1956, and 12,000 more were pushed to resign. In the summer of 1948, the House Committee on Un-American Activities began its public investigation of communists in government. Despite the investigations, Truman narrowly defeated Dewey in the elections, but international and national events seemed to conspire to ramp up anti-communist feeling in the United States. In August 1949, the Soviet Union exploded its own atomic bomb. In October 1949, Mao Zedong had driven the nationalists from China and then aligned China with the USSR. At home, Alger Hiss had been indicted for perjury in 1949 and convicted the next year. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were convicted in 1951 for espionage and were executed in 1953. The Cold War was launched and it would form national and international policy for another generation. In June 1950, North Korea launched its invasion of South Korea triggering U.S. intervention in the Korean War, which lasted until the July 1953 armistice. By the end of the war, roughly 1.7 million Americans had served in the war in Korea with nearly 34,000 battle deaths. 
The Korean mobilization accounted for nearly a third of the 5.72 million Americans in uniform worldwide. Meanwhile, Senator Joe McCarthy, R. Wisconsin, was ramping up his increasingly popular campaign to ferret out communists who he claimed had infiltrated the State Department. Anti-communism, including the enforcement of loyalty oaths in universities, was real. In 1953, the Group for the Advancement of Psychiatry, formed in 1946 by noted psychiatrist William A. Menninger, met to discuss the psychological effects on Americans of loyalty oaths. A gap committee charged with investigating the oaths reported that such oaths were only one manifestation in a growing general trend toward enforcement of conformity of thinking and acting. Observers as diverse as Alexis de Tocqueville and Hannah Arendt had made the observation that American society, while politically free, tended to be socially oppressive. The 1950s opened with the publication of a book that would become in some ways emblematic of the decade, The Lonely Crowd. Written by American David Reisman, The Lonely Crowd would provide an influential analysis of American society. Reisman, who had been influenced by Arendt's book, The to Origins of Totalitarianism, posited three main personality types, tradition-directed, interdirected, and other-directed. The title of Reisman's book is somewhat misleading. In the end, it is not so much about alienation and conformity as it is about what Reisman perceived as a shift from an economy based on production to a consumerist economy. Whereas the tradition and interdirected types once were well matched with social needs, since the Industrial Revolution, the other directed type had become increasingly well adapted to modern life. The other directed person wants to be loved rather than esteemed, Reisman wrote, not necessarily to control others, but to relate to them. Those who are other directed need assurance that they are emotionally in tune with others. By the 1940s, the other directed character was beginning to dominate society. This concern over conformity had its intellectual roots not only in Arendt, but also in 20th century existentialist thought, the writings of Sartre, Heidegger, and before then the German philosophical tradition. The compulsion to keep up with the Joneses, named after the eponymous newspaper cartoon, was commonly recognized and decried in post-war America. Advertising role in fostering and mobilizing conformity of tastes and views grew as the new medium, television, became more and more ubiquitous through the 1950s. Two other influential books dominated popular thought through the 1950s, White's The Organization Man and The Fictional Man in the Gray Flannel Suit by Sloan Wilson, published in 1955. White's book provided social analysis of ethos inside corporate America. The organization man slow boils with the complaint that the Protestant ethic was losing ground to the social ethic, wrote Gary Cernovitz in a 2016 New Yorker piece revisiting White's book after 60 years. White was no Ayn Rand, whose Atlas Shrugged was published less than a year after the organization man. White argued for an individualism within organization life. But he still saw a rebalancing of American values chipping away at Americans' human potential and their happiness. The book has three chapters on the neuroses of organization man. To White, the central problem was that the organization men actually liked being organization men. These tendencies and political currents, organizational conformity, McCarthyism, consumerism, worried social critics. Of course, two groups of Americans, women and minorities, were still not fully a part of the equation. Not until 1963 would Betty Friedan's landmark book, The Feminine Mystique, appear. But the central pathology the book addresses was nevertheless widespread during the 1950s. The problem lay buried, unspoken, for many years in the minds of American women. It was a strange stirring, a sense of dissatisfaction, a yearning, that is a longing, that women suffered in the middle of the 20th century in the United States. Each suburban housewife struggled with it alone. As she made the beds, shopped for groceries, she was afraid to ask even of herself the silent question, is this all? By the advent of the 1960s, American women had given up ground. 
1920, 20% 20 of PhDs were awarded to women. By 1963, it was 11%. 47% of college students were women in 1920. In 1963, 38%. The median age at first marriage continued to drop for women. Almost half the women who married in 1963 were teenagers. In 1963, women's pay was 59% of men's, less than in 1951. Women were being reassured by opinion leaders that women belong primarily in the home, that they should not be competing with men in the workplace. On television, a subversive Lucille Ball got at these issues obliquely and artfully entertaining Americans, but reminding them that the real substantial issues lay behind the humor. Yes, I know that. But they don't always have a little note in the back like this one. Dear Keller, don't put this through till next month. I might at this point pause and see if there are any questions or comments or any discussion that anybody might uh, want to start. The sound improved slightly when you turned up the, it up, but not a, a lot. And just now couldn't uh, hear anything that they really said on this image that's there now. Oh, okay. Um, I, I don't know if it would help to use your external mic. Yeah, I think what I'll do is, is make that switch if you'll just bear with me. Hold on just a second. I can hear it pretty well, but I always have my computer set loud because I have windows open and there's traffic and stuff going by, but. Yeah, that was um, my concern. Is that better? Let's see here. Is that better for people? Yeah, sure. Try playing the um, video again. Okay. I'll play it again here. No. No. Yes, I know that. But they don't always have a little note in the back like this one. They are teller. Be a lineman. Their vocalization is much better. Is that better for people? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, good. Uh, at this point, I just thought I'd pause and um, see if there was anything anybody wanted to add or any reflections or reminiscences, com reminiscences, comments. I just wanted to note, make a note of uh, the image where it showed the women and them coming into being. The uh, little statue that was on top of the television was very curious. Yes, both of them are. It's an interesting photo. Um, and I, I'd have to investigate that further <laughs> to see. <laughs> that is, looks almost like a, a panther, maybe a pet panther. I, I really don't know. But yeah, these are interesting images and um, uh, an interesting time. Clay, it's it, uh, it it's really uh, helpful and uh, and disturbing at the same time to to be pulled back into the influences of uh, of advertising uh, and uh, uh, cultural conformity, intellectual conformity. And thinking back, you know, the, these times that that. Uh, that tend to be kind of viewed through a, through a rosy, uh, blurry, mid, uh, um, kind of uh, long distance back view. But uh, 
but there were a lot, there were some really disturbing trends that that are that are hit, hitting us full force now. Yeah, and I um, uh, coming right up, I have something that it might be interesting. Uh, the the effect of, of McCarthyism, as we call it now, uh, was pervasive, but uh, but for I think a lot of Americans, something that was not acute, but nevertheless there in the background and, and just kind of ambient, if you will. And uh, so probably very few people as a percentage, well, very few people as a percentage of the American population were directly affected, say lost their jobs or, or were blacklisted, but that and the, the loyalty oaths, the, um, the emphasis on uh, anti-communism, I think did have an effect as, as uh, Dr. Menninger noted in, in, that, uh, in that report that they made. Uh, and it's sort of a, a bit disturbing or quite disturbing to me, um, the message that's still in our minds how many of us could sing along with the Pepsodent song in our minds? Right. Uh, you wonder where the yellow went when we brush our teeth with Pepsodent. <laughs> that, yeah. should, that shouldn't be there. <laughs> yeah, I think um, the, I, this old uh, advertising of the 1950s, both uh, print and television was just fascinating. And I, I'm hope, what I hope is that seeing these ads gives <coughs> gives us more perspective on the advertising of our own time because uh, that was the infancy of advertising and uh, ad, ad men because they were mostly men were looking at psychological research and uh, the best thought of the time on how they could influence people and this new medium was uh, was it just incredible, powerful, incredibly powerful in terms of that truth claim that it laid in front of people. I think we maybe, and we could talk about this, maybe have somewhat come out the other side of that because now we, I think at least some people are more discerning about uh, the role of media in their lives and that the democratization of media has has taken away some of those truth claims because now anyone can broadcast on their own channel, so to speak. But uh, maybe we could get a discussion going on that. I have a couple of things that came into the chat, Clay. Um, one is uh, this ad shows women watching TV all day while they do their women's work. Any measures of daytime TV watching by women in the 1960s? Um, no, that's a very good question. And I could uh, get back to that. I'll make a note of that. Um, I, I remember doing some research on daytime programs and viewership, but I did not, um, I did not include it in the, uh, in the in the program okay um, next question this is a really good one um is i wonder about this too often well, can i just add one thing about that oh, a yeah. little bit later in the paper uh pat weaver a tremendously influential nbc uh executive uh pioneered the the time of day approach to tv programming and mm -hmm. he basically came up with the idea of the today show which was tremendously popular and got people thinking about television as a part of their day mm -hmm. rather than as something they might tune into on an ad hoc basis. But sorry, I interrupted you. But. Okay, it's okay. The next one is just, did the economic structure of the 50s allow a one earner family to exist with a greater sense of comfort um, to achieve the American dream? I, I think the general, and again, I did not, um, I don't make a case for that in, um, in, uh, in this program, but I think both anecdotally and then uh, 
in terms of the data, that is the case. I think that was part of the prosperity of the 1950s that one job, usually the man working, uh, the husband uh, in most cases, could support a family in a middle-class lifestyle. Uh, I think we saw in those charts, maybe I'll just briefly go back here. Um, uh, the 70s it were, as those of us who, I was graduating from college in the mid 70s, just really horrible decade for uh, uh, economically. We suffered a lot of shocks, the end of the Vietnam War, the, um, the uh, Arab, uh, so-called Arab oil embargo, um, stagflation, and you can see the effects, whereas the 50s and then the 60s were um, remarkable decades. Uh, you know, but we were the one, one of the few countries that had not been devastated by the war. Uh, and moreover, our industrial growth was able to make that transition from a wartime footing to a peacetime footing. And uh, so I think, I think that is true that uh, uh, one income would have been sufficient for uh, a family to live comfortably. And um, I, I think that's true. I don't have the data right at my fingertips to prove it, but um, my sense is that, that that's true. Yeah. The last question I have in the chat right now is if you know when soap operas took off, like As the World Turns and those directed at women who were home watching TV while they ironed or mended or fixed dinner. Yeah, that programming, um, a lot of that programming, early TV programming migrated from radio. Uh, so a lot of these shows were um, radio programs that, uh, that made the transition. Um, and uh, if you look at, you can go on your uh, search engine, um, hold on, uh, and, and look up TV schedules from 1952 or 53, and, and you'll see yeah, that, uh, would that be when, like, Leave It to Beaver, which is sort of an iconic family? Uh, yeah, I can't remember the precise dates for Leave It to Beaver, and I get into this in, in shortly. Um, that how the genre is kind of uh, uh, morphed over the years. Um, early in the, in, at least, I'm talking about evening crime time TV programming. Early in the decade, there were a lot of uh, variety shows. Uh, Milton Berle was. I guess one of the most popular, uh, Arthur Godfrey was tremendously popular. Um, a number of uh, the stars, Dinah Shore, a lot of the stars of that era had their own variety shows. And these were kind of a staple uh, during the first half of the, of the decade. And I'll, I'll get into that shortly and we could pick up on that because it's a fascinating um, topic and maybe by next by next session I might be able to uh, uh, do a little bit more work on that and maybe add respond to those better. I have a question, if I may. Um, sure. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering when you talked about um, restrictive covenants, like uh, the racial restrictive covenants that were um, made. It unenforceable by Shelley versus Kramer, the Supreme Court case in 1948. Were those covenants common in um, Holland in residential areas? And in, in residential deeds, were those covenants common? I, I haven't done um, any research in Holland. It does ring a bell because I know there was recently there was someone who uh, there were some folks doing some work on that and they they did discover some. And uh, as I recall, now you'd have to go back and, and look at the records. I can tell you that um, this isn't in Holland, Michigan, but where we lived in uh, California in the 60s, I remember for some reason I was a curious child and uh, looking through some of our household records and reading through the deed to our home. Why I did this, I do not know. <laughs> um, and I remember reading 
in there something like no person other of a race other than the Caucasian may may own a home in and um, this we were in a very nice area of Santa Barbara um, and I remember reading that and just kind of going hmm you know that's interesting and it might have even I don't think it said anything about religion I don't know if it said Jewish people weren't allowed there, but it could very well have. Um, so, yeah, I think my I, sense I, is, no, I was just going to say my sense is that they were not uncommon. Okay, because I, I, the only one I'm familiar with is something that involved my family too in, in suburban, uh, well, just outside of Detroit, Kigo Harbor, Michigan. We did have a property that had a covenant that uh, actually we were violating, <laughs> but it was unenforceable. You know, it was a, a racial and religious restrictive covenant. Right. So, but, but, you know, I guess it's not illegal, but unenforceable after that Supreme Court decision. Well, I know um, a lot of country clubs had these restrictions. Uh, so it was something in American society and I, I don't focus on it. it. You could, it would be interesting. You could do a whole, well, as you know, you could write a book on, on this topic and I'm, I know they have been, but uh, um, it wasn't something I think people talked about. Maybe it was just something that people expected. It was part of their, uh, oh yeah, that's a, that's an area. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I think that was the case though. Good question yeah. though. Thank you for bringing that up. I'd like to, uh, to comment on, first of all, I'm feeling somewhat ashamed having been a copywriter of, of, for BBDO and McCann Erickson. No, no, don't, I mean, it's advertising is a double-edged sword as, as the Smithsons uh, pointed out, but go ahead, Andrea. Um, and you know, where I, uh, for two years, I wrote copy for Chrysler and Pepsi, and then the next two years for Buick and Coke. Um, but in defense of trying to find some justification, you know, the FCC had uh, requirements uh, where broadcasters had, it wasn't, the onus wasn't on the agencies, but they had to produce public service spots, of which right. they put a lot of more focused on health and public safety. Um, and and then later, I think in the 70s, you had the, the Federal Advisory Committee, which also dictate, started dictating the length of, of commercials and encouraging uh, public advisory committees. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I don't know if those things still exist, particularly with the um, um, with the internet and the length of, of right. spots on the internet, et cetera. And wondered if you could comment on that. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Um, it it used to be, and back in the day that uh, our company, well, our company was involved in in. Uh, television uh, business, we had some TV stations in the company and uh, periodically your license would be come up for renewal and you had to keep a record of your community service, your community involvement and more or less prove to the FCC that you were broadcasting um, in, in the public interest. Obviously you were a private business and, and there to make a profit, but that was an element of uh, the licensing renewal process. And I, like you, I have not done any research on how significantly that is enforced these days. Um, uh, there's another topic for a paper would be the, um, the fairness doctrine in broadcasting. And that was, that was enforced at the time. And um, I'm not sure if that's fallen by the wayside as well. Yeah. It needs to be. <laughs> I have another comment. Um, McCarthy did affect us in a way, though, by hitting the uh, movie production entity because it really cut into them. Yeah. No, it did. And, and the blacklist, blacklist was very real. Um, it ruined some lives. And uh, and I by no means want to minimize that uh, at all. And uh, 
a little later on in this program, I have uh, kind of a neat little broadcast about uh, uh, Joe McCarthy's first speech. And I'd like to maybe stop after that and see if there are any comments or questions, because I think there, there may be some um, correspondences to our own, own time. You can let me know if you feel that way. Yeah, I, I have a comment in, um... 1975, I was a new graduate nurse and was hired at the VA hospital in Ann Arbor. And I, in my orientation, I, uh, well, to be hired, I had to sign a piece of paper saying I was not a communist. Wow. And I, I didn't realize that this is probably an offshoot of uh, Senator McCarthy's efforts that just carried on through, uh, through time. Absolutely. That was, um, that was, well, basically a loyalty oath. And that was mm -hmm. what uh, uh, Menninger and his, uh, who was a highly respected psychiatrist and, and the psychiatrist we're, we're talking about was um, the, this influence. So that's interesting that, that you had to do that. Yeah. Wow. Clay, you mentioned uh, the, the Fairness Doctrine. The Fairness Doctrine uh, uh, was uh, uh, eliminated by the FCC in 1987 during, during Reagan's presidency. Well, then, there you go. I, you know, it sounds kind of quaint nowadays, I guess, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, to add how things fit together. Yeah. Clay? Yes. Uh, one more follow-up to the- Yeah, no, that's great. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, it's Kit, and I, I had a follow-up question to the McCarthyism um, okay. age. Um, did it not go so far with him that he implicated uh, Dwight, uh, D, Dwight Eisenhower in his, um, what shall I say, trying to uh, round up communists? Do you remember that? Was Eisenhower also implicated by McCarthy well, that, at that time? Yeah, I think there were some aspersions cast on Eisenhower. And uh, as I understand it, uh, Eisenhower despised McCarthy personally from the time that he first learned about him, uh, but did not publicly uh, address his feelings about him what you may be referring to is the Army McCarthy hearings, which, uh, and I didn't know this until I started doing some research, apparently were a sort of sting uh, by the Eisenhower administration to basically get rid of McCarthy. Uh, and I'm, it's maybe not, as, maybe not the right place, although I could, I could come up with some uh, and people are interested in more info on this. Uh, the Army, the Army McCarthy hearings were the ultimately the downfall of, of McCarthy, and uh, there was no basis for this investigation of uh, uh, this uh, Army base and uh, alleged favoritism. It's interesting to note that Roy Cohn was. Uh, Senator McCarthy's right-hand man, if not his mentor in public life. And uh, that's, that could be another paper, um, Roy Cohn and, and his influence. But uh, you're right, uh, Eisenhower uh, was, you know, we, some of us might look back at that era and think of, as, uh, of Eisenhower as a conservative because he was a Republican and so forth, but um, he certainly was not uh, a fan of, of Joe McCarthy's, of Bill McCarthy, rather. Thank you. Yeah, no, you're welcome. Great, great comments and questions. If there are no other, I will proceed. And, uh, but at any time, please uh, interrupt uh, because that's what this is all about is to have a discussion. Um, I'm gonna move ahead now. Um, uh, for African-Americans, the 1954 landmark Supreme Court decision, Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, ushered in what civil rights activist Bayard Rustin called the classic phase of the American civil rights movement. 
The beginning of this period was marked by the integration of the armed forces, which had begun during the Truman administration the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott and Rosa Parks defiance of segregation laws in 1955. I, I just wanna say parenthetically, years ago, I had uh, happened to be seated next to um, John Sangstack at a dinner in Chicago and he was the publisher of the uh, Chicago Defender. And I remember asking him what was the single most significant civil rights event I don't know if I said in the 20th century or how I phrase it exactly, but he replied that it was uh, Truman's integration of the armed forces that made the biggest difference uh, to African Americans. And uh, so I just thought that was an interesting um, aside. I'm going to play this uh, short uh, uh, news feature. December 1st, 1975. On that day, Bad sound. Hmm. For some reason, Clay, this one is all garbled. So oh, is um, it? yeah, you might try sending me the link to if this is like on YouTube or something and I can email yeah. it out to everybody. Okay, yeah, we'll just skip that one. Um, we'll move on. I hope the next one isn't. Um, okay, moving on. McCarthyism's toll on the nation is harder to quantify. According to British historian David Cote, about 600 teachers and professors in the United States lost their jobs in the anti-communist purges, more than, more than half of them in the New York City area. But this added to the Truman Loyalty Program, executive order, and the entertainment industry blacklist created a palpable chilling effect throughout the country. And the cost and ruined lives has to this day not been fully reckoned and likely never will be. Let me know if this is not loud enough and I think there might be something I can do. No offense to Wheeling, West Virginia, the person who gets sent there to talk is the person at the bottom of the totem pole. Bill McCarthy's Senate career from 1946 until 1950 is one of repeated failure. No one is expecting him to win re-election. So what is most extraordinary here is that the most important speech in some ways of that generation is given in a place where there is a sense by the people who sent him there that nobody really cares what he has to say or is going to listen very hard. The expectation was that McCarthy was going to give a standard boilerplate speech that you give to uh, you know, Republican constituency in Wheeling, West Virginia. They really weren't sending him there to make headlines. He comes out and says that there are 205 communists in the State Department. Well, that's electrifying. It's so electrifying that people are almost distracted from the question of who these communists are, whether they actually exist, why does McCarthy know this and other people don't. It's, in a way, a kind of brilliant speech. We are the most powerful country in the world. We're the most influential country in the world. And yet we're losing everywhere. We're losing in Asia. We're losing in Europe. We're losing technologically now to the Soviets. How do we explain this? And what McCarthy does in Wheeling is to explain it by waving a list saying, we are being sold out by traders. McCarthy went off to Wheeling and gave the speech. And a local Associated Press reporter covered it. Imagine yourself as a newspaper reading American in early 1950. What's just been happening around the world in that home? 
Soviets had detonated their first atomic bomb. The United States has lost its nuclear monopoly. The Chinese Revolution ended, and the most populous country in the world is now under a communist dictator. At home, Roger Hiss, the epitome of the American establishment, has just been convicted for perjury. It looks like People that look and sound like the famous sort of Northeastern establishment are Soviet agents. Where is the world going? I mean, if, if Roger Hiss is a Soviet agent, well, Harry Truman could be a Soviet agent. John McCarthy is traveling to the United States on his Lincoln Day tour, and reporters keep coming up to him. Hey, Joe, do you really have the numbers? Are there really that many communists? And Joe would say, well, you know, let me go through my papers. Uh, I think we've got some names for you. He realized he had a thing, though. He found his shtick at last. <laughs> he called back to his office and he asked his secretary, are we getting any publicity? And she said, we're getting a lot of publicity. His secretary described him as being almost intoxicated with the joy and excitement of getting this much attention to the story. What's really interesting about Wheeling is that it takes a while for it to sink in. Once the attention starts to mount, the public really began to sort of link on to the fact that, oh my God, this guy's done his research. This guy has names, this guy has numbers. He has really gone and has scrupulously looked for information. He's doing research. McCarthy had no list in his hand. He had nothing in his hand. It was a fraud. Um, are there any comments or questions at this point? Any thoughts uh, before I go on? I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, McCarthy, but, uh, um, and move on, but uh, just wanted to pause and see if anybody had any thoughts or comments. Right, there was just um, something that came in later in the chat in regards to the um, advertisements which is a good point that uh, Diana mentioned that she would argue that a white man could support his family in the 50s, but we should not forget that many jobs were not available to African-Americans and she cannot imagine watching those ads with the exception of Roy C as an African-American. Right. Um, no, that's a, that's a great point. And I've tried to um, uh, keep that, you know, as something that we're dealing with. Um, in this program, in this uh, presentation. And in a little while I go into uh, the whiteness of television in the 50s. So I've been trying to kind of set up, set that up, but you're absolutely right. I, because it's not technically or, you know, an economics presentation, I, I didn't use any charts uh, with census data by, you know, broken out by race or anything, but you're absolutely right. Um, uh, I, I think there's also though, and I, I could work on this, um, maybe make a note. John F. Kennedy used that phrase, a rising tide lifts all boats. And um, I think to some extent, having acknowledged that life was much more difficult for minorities uh, to, for them to, to participate in the American dream. I think things did get better, um, obviously not enough, fast enough. And uh, uh, the civil rights movement really got going with this new phase in the mid 1950s. Um, and arguably I don't, well, so, that's a really good point, and I, I hope we can continue to talk about that as we uh, move through this program. There's a great comment, too, that just came in from Tom. Who'd have thought you could boldly lie to the American public and be believed? 
Yeah, I was I was hoping that, um, and again, you know, I was hoping that there might be some uh, discussion of McCarthy. Obviously, we're not experts on McCarthy. Having some of us maybe, but I'm not. But uh, it was uh, he was a demagogue, and demagoguery periodically reappears in our in our national history um, as and obviously elsewhere, but, uh, and television, I, I will say this, I think for McCarthy television proved to be both an incredibly powerful medium. Obviously the newspaper reporting was key um, to his influence, but television certainly did not hurt. A lot of his uh, hearings and so forth were uh, televised, um, so. Um, the new medium was not, you know, had not existed for long before somebody figured out a way to use it to uh, uh, affect public opinion. Any other thoughts? Anybody have any thoughts on, on this or anything that we've come, that we've done so far? All right, well, I'll move on. Um, Again, interrupt me at any time with a comment or uh, to let me know if something comes to mind. Clay, uh, yeah. uh, just a comment is Tom again. Uh, e uh, even after McCarthyism was discredited, um, it, it's, it had lasting, uh, per, you know, a kind of pervasive effects in American uh, culture and politics uh, that, you know, uh, Richard Nixon's career springboard was McCarthyist anti-communism. In fact, as was Ronald Reagan's, uh, they, they both came out of out of that era's uh, anti-communist fervor. Right, and I'm glad you brought that up. I was hoping that somebody would. I, um, uh, as with, is the case with so many of these historical events, uh, uh, they all provide there are a lot of connections and intertextualities, if you will. Um, but that is absolutely true. And uh, that the fear of communism was, was palpable. Uh, that's why I went into the, uh, uh, the advertising uh, organization and, and its, uh, its mission, which was to ensure that, that the American way of life was not endangered and uh, but as, as uh, the historian pointed out in this most recent uh, little clip, um, the people at that time coming off of the Korean War, the, the onset of the atomic age, uh, you remember we were being advised to build bomb shelters. Uh, kids had uh, atomic raid drills and so forth. Um, it, it, there was a lot of uh, anxiety, I think. And, uh, and again, when we do get to the twilight zone, I know probably some of you are thinking, well, I want to, I want to learn about the twilight zone. This is all trying to set up that, uh, that ambience of anxiety that was there in the 50s. And uh, certainly uh, the atomic age, the Cold War, McCarthy, this all had an unsettling effect. So good point, uh, Tom, thank you for bringing that up. Um, anybody else have a thought or want to contribute anything at this point? Okay, well, we'll, we'll move ahead. Um, in January, 1954, the height of McCarthy's favorable Gallup poll ratings and before the 36 day Army McCarthy hearings, which by the way, had an estimated 20 million TV viewers. 50% of those polled said they had a favorable view of McCarthy. A highly critical TV broadcast by Edward R. Murrow and Senate censure in December, 1954 sealed his fate, however, and he died of alcoholism in 1957 at 48. Edward R. Murrow, you'll remember was the uh, esteemed and distinguished uh, primarily radio journalist uh, during World War II. And, uh, and he repudiated McCarthy and that was, uh, was tremendously influential. 
But to your point, Tom, a 1956 Gallup poll, and this is shortly before McCarthy's death, death and after his uh, um, downfall, a 1956 Gallup poll found that the favorable, favorable rating of Joe McCarthy was at 35%. So despite um, Senate censure and just widespread condemnation of McCarthy's tactics, uh, he still had a 35% positive rate, favorable rating in a national Gallup poll. Something to kind of keep in mind uh, to your point, Tom. In a 1978 review of Coates' book, The Great Fear, the Anti-Communist Purge Under Truman and Eisenhower, historian Arthur Schlesinger Jr., himself the target of FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover's ire, urges us not to forget the madness of the times the fright in Congress, state legislatures, and the press, the purges in government, the professions, the arts, the unions, the reaction in the courts, the awful price in wrecked careers and blasted lives. It is a shameful story. I trust it will remind us in bad times to come that the Constitution remains a sounder guide than patriotic paranoia. So that's the first. Uh, um, part of the program. Uh, I can move, I'll can. i move on now. Um, I'll, anything anybody wants to say, I just always want to make sure people uh, feel comfortable bringing something up that I thought that they might have. I just thought of the program, which I watched vigorously as a child, was You Are There. Oh, OK. That Which was came uh, out in 53, I think it started. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, that was the gospel. <laughs> yeah. Can you speak to the the feeling that you had? I mean, was there a sense of authority to this? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Considering I was only us. <laughs> seven years old when it started right. or so. <laughs> but you were probably aware, I mean, were you, were you watching with your parents or somebody else in your family or? I, I don't recall. I mean, mm -hmm. I probably wasn't alone. I'm from a big family, so okay. I doubt, <laughs> doubt that I but, was alone. <laughs> but, you know, I think children pick up on, on things. And uh, so, yeah, that's... Uh, that's what uh, Seldis and others were talking about, the, the immediacy of television and being able to see things and not just hear them on the radio. Well, part two, um, I've titled uh, Television in the 1950s, Growth, Growing Pains and Conformity. The political climate of the time committed to the homogenization of television programming in the 1950s. As early as 1949, Ed Sullivan was reportedly using Counterattack, a weekly anti-communist newsletter to vet prospective guests on his Talk of the Town variety show. Counterattack was published by three former FBI agents and financed by Alfred Kohlberg a textile importer who was also a founding advisor of the John Birch Society. In truth, Counterattack and its subsidiary publications, such as Red Channels, the report on communist influence in radio and television, were to a great degree rackets. American business consultants, Kohlberg's group, would investigate a prospective employee for $5. Clients included Bendix, DuPont, General Motors, and other big employers. Or if you were worried, you could buy clearance from ABC. The Hearst Press jumped on the story and trumpeted red infiltration of radio TV Baird. Counterattack promoted itself by proclaiming a copy of Red Channels should be in every American home next to the, TV, the radio or TV set. In December 1950, CBS ordered all its employees to sign a loyalty oath. NBC had by that time already required new employees to sign a loyalty pledge. Meanwhile, ABC opened an internal security office 
to liaise with the House Un-American Activities Committee. Clay, I'm going to interrupt yeah. you for, for a moment. To just uh, We've got about a minute left before 11 o'clock. So I, I didn't know exactly where you wanted to, you know, to make a division of the, of the course. No, that's good. I think this is a good place to stop um, because we're right at the point where uh, we start to talk about self-censorship and active censorship. So I will see you all next week and I hope, um, hope you all come back. Hope I haven't bored you and uh, uh, please come back with questions and comments. Thank you, Clay. It's been a fascinating hour and a half. I'm, I'm, eager, I'm eager to be back next okay. week. I think it just gets better from here, too. <laughs> All righty. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. You too.